Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Fruit of City Council meeting. Um, it is now 7.01 p.m. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, Deb, would you please call roll? Councillor Buck? Here. Councillor Lenhart? Here. 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 Councillor O'Brien? Here. Mr. Freeman? Here. All right. If you'd all please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We have an agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? No changes to the agenda, Mr. Mayor. All right, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Councillor Linhart? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Harvey? Yes. Councillor Cry? Yes. Councillor Buck? Yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. All right, uh, tonight we've got uh, one presentation and it's uh, something we haven't been able to do for a while. So it's kind of, it's a really great to get back to uh, recognizing our students and teachers uh, with uh, uh, our student and teacher of the month for October. Uh, this evening we've got Rimrock Elementary. And so I've got a couple certificates here and I'd like to read those and then uh, have the recipients come up here to the front. I'm sure there'll be some people that wanna take some photos in that of it. Um, so uh, the first one that I've got is for our outstanding student. Um, and I, I, want, I want to make sure I get this right. Is it Renan Pryor? Renan, Renan Pryor. All right, you want to come on up? Renan uh, is being recognized by the Fruit of City Council for his outstanding attitude, love of helping others, spreading positivity, and preserving through difficult paths and perseverance through difficult paths. Brennan also takes ownership of his actions and is such a good friend. We thank you very much. So we got a park pack or a red center pack right here also for you. Yes. Absolutely. Sure, and sure, and sure. the principal, and come on up. Should go front? Go stand front back just stand back here. We got the whole fam. <laughs> Yeah. Thumbs up and cheese. Oh. Thumbs up and cheese. Bye, <laughs> buddy. All right. All right, and then we've our teacher uh, of the month is Mary Helms. <clears throat> Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's I, I know she helps all the teachers. Let me tell you. Okay. We lost one. Oh, 
<laughs> All right, well, thank you, everyone. It's uh, great to see uh, the students and the teachers out here. And um, with that, we're going to move into our public participation time. So this section is set aside for the city council to listen to comments by the public regarding items that do not otherwise appear on the agenda. Generally, the city council will not discuss the issue and will not take an official action. I think most of our public's leaving, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody's at home. Yeah, that's right. Got a few online. I don't know how that works, but we've got Dave Krause online and in person and Dan Karras. Wow, that's um, impressive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to open up the public comment. Is there anybody that'd like to speak on anything not on the agenda? All right, hearing none, uh, we're going to move into the consent agenda. So these are all items where all conditions or requirements have been agreed to or met prior to the time they come before council for final action. Uh, all these items will be approved by a single motion of council. We're going to open that up to public comment. Is there anybody who'd like to speak on that item? Hearing none, we'll bring it back to council. Any questions or do we have a motion? Mr. Mayor, I move we approve the consent agenda as printed. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Cry? Yes. Councilor Buck? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. All right, we do not have any hearings tonight. And so we're going to move into our administrative agenda. Our first item is our only administrative item is budget presentations. And we have three of those tonight. So our first one is the marketing strategy for 2022. We've got Shannon Vassen, our uh, assistant to the city manager, presenting tonight. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the 2022 Marketing and Promotion Fund budget. Um, overall, it's been a very good year for our marketing and promotion efforts. After a difficult year last year, our lodging tax has rebounded rather significantly this year. And we are also able to bring back several of the events. Um, come back this year and welcome those, as well as a few new events as well. So really excited to be presenting this budget. Um, starting off with 2021 accomplishments, I want to start off with recognizing our bookends of the Grand Valley Partnership. Um, you know, it's been a goal for the Fruta Tourism Advisory Council and the Palisade Tourism Advisory Board for several years to partner together to leverage our very limited resources that we have for marketing uh, to put them together and work together on marketing initiatives. So this was the first year that we were able to do that. We started off with what we're calling our Digital Maturity Project. Um, this project was funded through a grant through the Car Out Tourism Office. And basically, um, the FTAC has long been interested in determining how do our lodging tax dollars actually relate to people traveling to Fruta? How can we best track conversions? So we talked about this a lot last year and we decided, you know, let's apply for this digital maturity program and um, kind of use a digital platform to try to determine that. So that's been going very successful. Um, we actually have been using the program called Sojourn and uh, we are able to run a nine month advertising campaign uh, with the town of Palisade and that's been going very well. I have some numbers for you on the next slide regarding that. Another program that we're working on with the uh, Palisade Tourism Advisory Board is called the Restart Destinations Program. Uh, basically, very similar to what we get for the rural, res uh, what Fruit is doing for the Rural Resiliency Recovery Roadmap Program with the 17 other partners um, we're doing with the Town of Palisade for our tourism efforts. So the CTO has hired a consultant to come up with a strategic plan for both of our joint marketing partnerships. <laughs> that will eventually create that strategic plan that will have goals, action items, and uh, projects that we can work on towards the future. So really excited to be partnering with the town of Palisade. We think both um, communities complement each other really well, especially with the addition of the Palisade Fund. So uh, this is a partnership we've been working on and excited to do that this year. Um, another goal this year was to explore new digital marketing advertisement campaigns to attract conversions. Um, this ad to your right that you see, which I actually need to move the Zoom participants, but I can send this to you afterwards if needed, um, is an ad that people see, and if they click, then Sojourn kind of determines the behavior they do after that. So through September, we've actually had 1.4 million impressions um, on this ad. 1.4 million people have seen this or a similar ad. Um, that's 216 travelers, and um, Sojourn predicts it's about $56,000 in revenue for the Grand Valley. They estimate when people travel here, they're going to be spent on average about $450 per so this digital advertising campaign is actually running through the end of the year, and right now we're running joint advertising <clears throat> with the town of Palisade. 
and uh, we've been working on that. So very excited to see this, and I think the FTAC is excited as well because they've long tried to figure out, you know, how do our marketing efforts actually relate to people traveling? <coughs> we have many tools that can do that, but we're glad to be able to add it to our uh, advertising uh, portfolio this year. Um, additional goals for 2021, we want to continue to grow our photo and video library. Um, our, we've been creating a number of these local storytelling videos, which actually do very well on all of our social media platforms on our website as well. Um, this one that I have up here is of a local family, the Griffins. Kelly Griffin serves on our Fruit of Tourism Advisory Council. And uh, in this one minute video, she talks, you know, how great of a uh, family fun place Fruita is. And, you know, they like going to the bike park, like going out to 18 Road and stuff like that. So these have been performing very well. You know, our target audience, as we've kind of discussed a lot in these presentations, tend to be those front range families. And actually most of our travelers that we can see come from front range, you know, Denver, Car House, Fruita area. Um, so we want to continue to promote uh, our, our <coughs> this plays into our uh, advertising campaign that we've been doing for several years to play like a local campaign. So um, we've been creating a number of those and have a few that are in production that we'll be excited to share with you as well later. Um, another thing as part of that CTO grant, we're also creating some responsible tourism content. Um, you know, we want to create photos and videos that show people recreating responsibly um, just to make sure that you know, when people are traveling on the public lands, they are respecting those public lands and never using trails or public lands when they shouldn't be using them. So we're trying to incorporate, incorporate that into our messaging and of course our advertisement library as well. Um, additionally, another goal for this year was to expand content to specific target audiences. We've been uh, doing this in a few ways. Um, our, most of our audience on social media tends to be younger, about 25 to 40 age range. Um, as far as uh, other avenues that we use, we have the website, but we also do email lists as well. Um, that helps reach some of our other uh, visitors that are not on traditional social media pages. And what we've been doing to expand content to those specific target audiences, we've actually been segregating the information between in-state and out-of-state visitors. So some information that may not be relevant to, to out-of-state visitors like Glenwood Canyon is closed, please don't travel <laughs> through Glenwood Canyon. We've been sending just that to in-state and some of the out-of-state visitors on the Utah side, we've been making specific messages for them. So that's one goal that we've been working on and trying to get the best information that we can to potential travelers, whether in-state or out-of-state. Oh, it's my play. Um, other accomplishments that I wanna to touch upon this year, uh, the Fruit City Council did approve $7,000 for the billboard replacement of the billboard we own off I-70. Um, most of the work is done. We replaced the poles. I wanna say those poles were, I don't even know, 50, 60 years old. Um, I think we bought them used when we actually put up the billboard, um, but we replaced the poles. We replaced the backing as well. And also the, um, the, the, pieces that actually hold the actual billboard, which here, from hearing from Family Wealth Health, Health West, it actually helps them out quite a bit because it's not as difficult to remove all the, the images that they have on the billboard so far. The only thing we're waiting on are the lights, and I think we're getting those installed at the end of this month. So um, billboard replacements will be done after a few years of uh, waiting to do those. Um, additionally, another goal that we always have is to award at least three or more mini grants uh, to local marketing initiatives or um, to uh, local events. This year, we're up to two, up from one last year, but granted, last year was a pandemic year, so kind of given that one a little bit of a pass. Uh, this year, we did award a mini grant to a new event in Fruta called the Kids Adventure Games. Um, basically, it's a very abbreviated triathlon hosted by Kids Adventure Games at a Highline State Park where local youth <coughs> or those traveling here uh, run a variety of different obstacles. They have to swim, bike, um, hearing from the organizer of that event, it went really well. They had really good attendance. I want to say 150, 160 people participated in that. So we awarded a mini grant to them, and another mini grant that you recently approved at our last council meeting was to create a mural at the Fruta Copper Club to kind of add to the flair of uh, downtown Fruta. Um, additionally, as Mayor Kincaid knows, I'm not sure if I can say this is an accomplishment yet, but we're going through our consultant selection process. There has been a lot of discussion on that. Uh, we hope to wrap it up within the next week or two and bring that contract to the city council for approval. We estimate maybe a two-year contract, so we'll bring that to you. Um, in addition to that, we also uh, have been working on other new marketing initiatives. One thing we did this year is we actually gave away a trip to a local Front Range family to come to Fruita. Um, we did that through an email blast to the Car Out Tourism Office, and I think they're coming next month. Um, but basically, we paid for, you know, day at Dinosaur Journey, you know, some gift cards to downtown businesses, lodging. 
and uh, we'll kind of document that and share their story as they travel through it and kind of share, you know, their experience as they come here. So I think that'll be great content uh, to use in the future. And of course, it'll be a good trip for them as well. Um, from that email blast to the Car Out Tourism office, we had about 580 people sign up and also we got 200 new subscribers to our GoFruta newsletter, which is great because that's how we can deliver that targeted uh, content to our uh, <coughs> Uh, in addition, we're also doing a partnership with the Roaring Fork Transit, um, trying to get people from the Carbondale, Aspen area, come take a day trip to Fruta and trying to determine how those correlate to conversions. You know, we use uh, uh, you know, bit URLs and <clears throat> QR codes to see how many people actually view the ads and uh, whether or not they'll be able to come to Fruta. Hopefully we'll work on that in the future. So moving on to 2022 uh, marketing and promotion budget highlights. Um, revenues, as I was saying earlier, lodging tax has rebounded significantly in 2021. Um, through July, it is up 146% over 2020. And even through 2019, it is up 30%. Um, 2019 wasn't our best year for the lodging tax, but I want to say it was very close, maybe five or $6,000 off. So we're trending very well. So we have $137,000 in projected revenues, projected expenses. We have $137,000 as well. Um, don't know where Margaret is, but I think that is a balanced budget. <laughs> um, and you will notice our expenses are decreasing this year while our revenues are increasing. That's because last year the council did approve uh, the FTAC, the ability to use fund balance to help supplement our efforts due to increased revenue and decreased expenses we budgeted pretty conservatively last year or this year. We probably won't need to pull from that. So the decrease in uh, expenses is due to that. And of course, we're closing out the grant through the Car Out Tourism Office. So yeah, with that, we're predicting adding about $41,000 to our fund balance, bring it up to 203. What we're gonna spend that money on is a great question, but we'll continue to talk about that. Um, other highlights for next year, we have about $80,000 uh, for our advertising promotion efforts. $65,000 of that will go to our consultant that will implement our marketing plan. Um, which will be discussed when we uh, go over the contract with the council. We've, we've also set aside $10,000 for um, to update our GoFruta website. We think uh, it could be more user-friendly. We could also clean up a lot of the broken links, a lot of the broken pages. And also we could ma probably make it more uh, easier to update in real time. Um, we'd like to look at, or during the pandemic, we were looking at what a lot of other organizations were doing. I think just do the functionality of our website. We don't have that ability. So we set aside $10,000 to do a complete redesign. That's something that the FTAC has really wanted and I think will be a good addition to our efforts. <clears throat> and we have an additional $5,000 just set aside for miscellaneous marketing efforts. Uh, mini grants, back, bringing that back up to 4,000, hope that somebody applies for that money. Uh, special events, um, the FTAC uh, every year does fund uh, special events in Fruta. This year we received eight applications. Uh, the FTAC did recommend funding all eight <laughs> applications with a few minimal changes. Um, the applications are listed up here, but I will know uh, two new events that are being funded, the Cotuit and the Roxy events. That's the uh, desert gravel race that brought uh, well over a thousand people here in May. And the Rexy event, I'm not sure what the attendance is there, um, but that's actually being held at the end of this month. So it'll be interesting to hear from Desert Gravel to see how that one. I think that one's much more intense. I think the minimum's like 200 some miles on a gravel bike. So I don't know if that'll bring as many people. Uh, but yeah, you can see the events up there, um, 18 Hours Fruit at Riverfront Concert Series, go to it, Fruit of Fall Festival, Rimrock Rodeo. And then the other three events, uh, the FTAC did recommend continuing to fund the Fruit of Farmer's Market, Mike Pedal's Chicken and the Thursday Night Concert Series, uh, bringing our total to $25,000 for special events next year. Uh, finally, talking about our 2022 goals, um, uh, we want to complete and begin implementing the strategic marketing plans for our bookends of the Grand Valley. Uh, very excited to be working on our consultant with that, and we hope that probably early next year um, they'll have that strategic plan done and we can actually apply for grants or uh, fund projects based upon the feedback from that strategic plan. Uh, as discussed earlier, we want to revamp and redesign the gofruta.com website just to make it more user friendly, clean it up a little bit, and also to improve how it looks on mobile since uh, we're finding more, a majority of our users actually do website on mobile devices as opposed to a URL, but I think it's just kind of um, how people get their information now. Um, additionally, we want to continue to evaluate different marketing tools for conversions. Um, Sojourn has been working great, uh, but I think we... I got with Pal saying we did discuss whether or not we want to apply for another grant this cycle. We decided to hold off just because we really want to evaluate what worked best for us. And uh, the CTO does offer is offering a new cycle in early next year. So we'll probably want to evaluate what other tools we can use and what will best serve our interests as far as our strategic plan. And of course, our fruit of specific um, 
uh, tools as well. And finally, want to continue to grow and develop the photo and video library for our advertisement assets. Um, this year, we dabbled into, uh, as you'll see, uh, gravel riding on the right. Those are our friends at Cara Backcountry Biker. They took our consultant up to Kingsview Road. And uh, that's becoming quite the trend. So uh, happy to uh, add advertisement assets on there and of course promote all the great resources we have for gravel riding in the valley. And also we're um, kind of branching out to highlighting some other activities that people may be interested in, you know, rock climbing, you know, we've cam canyon, gravel riding, um, more river access, uh, stuff like that. So um, that is the bulk of my presentation. If you have any questions, of course, I'd be happy to answer them. Anybody have any questions for Shannon? That's great. All right, good job. Thanks. You talked fast. Oh, Dan's gonna have to. That's great. Up. Yeah. Dan's gonna have to keep up with that one. Yeah. And you know, I was just gonna say that. Well, you don't. Yeah. I have to say that. Um, you know, the, I know the mini grants aren't. It's not a lot of money, but it would really be nice to have the the recipients maybe come after the fact and just do a little uh, report to yeah. the council or. Little presentation. We have all the ones we give the grants to the twenty five thousand. We have them come and present after their events each year to the tourism board too. Oh, but not to council. Not to council. Oh, okay. I mean, we should ask them to do that. I just there's only like two of them. Not yeah, the the mini grants there. Mini grants this year. Last year we did Carl Canyons. They printed those maps are at all the public land. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's something if this group is interested in. I know Kayla. She's the recipient of about nine thousand of those dollars she presents on that but some of the other events probably as well if you were in yeah not the not the special events yeah just mini grants. yeah yeah because yeah. the special events happen all the time all right thank you shannon <laughs> all right our next budget presentation is our planning department uh is from dan Karras, our planning development director so you noticed how quick shannon talked so I heard on the way over that he did this in what, one minute and 48 seconds? Is that what I heard correctly? And that concludes my presentation. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, uh, my name is Dan Karras. I'm going to be giving the presentation for the 2022 budget. Uh, just uh, kind of by way of introduction, uh, just kind of let you know a little bit about our process. We've got four employees, including myself. We got a code enforcement officer, a planning technician, and a planner, and then a department head. Uh, just want to, you know, kind of illustrate sort of the differences between 2020 and 2021. You know, in 2020, we we reviewed 21 uh, land development applications. You know, that includes annexations, zoning, subdivisions, site designs with adjustment. And then this year, we did 41, and so definitely kind of a heavy lift for uh, for a relatively small department, but. Uh, that not all those projects, but several of those projects uh, uh, sort of resulted in 470 planning clearances issued. There's about $1.2 million, you know, in total from the beginning of the year. That includes impact fees and, you know, use tax on building materials and sort of supports kind of the construction industry and then the development of 42 uh, new residential planning clearances issued, which is essentially new construction, new builds um, uh, for residential homes. Uh, these are the projects that, uh, that all have development uh, agreements associated with them. Uh, these are all uh, residential projects uh, that are in various iterations or uh, processes uh, uh, that eventually will go to construction. Obviously you'll see like the well preliminary plan that hasn't gone to construction yet, but we have other ones like uh, Village of Country Creek, Final Platte, uh, Grand Valley Estates, Orchard Ridge, uh, Red Cliffs, all those are under construction and uh, some of those have been completed and this is just the residential uh, growth for subdivisions. Uh, this is something I, I, I think that we should all be very proud of. I mean, we've, we've had a couple of multifamily projects that are you know, a direct sort of uh, connection to some of the changes that we made in the comp plan, some of the changes that we made in the land use code. So, here are essentially uh, street elevations of uh, 111 Mesa and uh, uh, Mulberry Street multifamily. Both of those are you know, around 18, 19 actual apartments, uh, two story, uh, under 35 feet, and I think kind of good infill you know, additions to our community on relatively small lots that there were vacant lots, um, or at least the Mulberry Street 
one had a had a small uh, structure on it, but but will be removed as uh, as a result. And so I just want to point out that you know these these projects are being built on similar size uh, lots as just a, a regular single family home in our community community residential uh, zone district. So just wanted to point that out. We also have a couple other commercial projects that have been um, either remodels or or are. Uh, under construction, Mike's Famous Chicken. Obviously, everybody is aware of the Copper Club renovation and that that remodel, which is transition uh, from a, a daycare uh, into the Copper Club. And as a result of that, Mike's Famous Chicken is you know renovating the previous Copper Club space uh, and is nearing completion. And Skip's Market and then Monument Powder Coating is close to being completed. Well, actually, they just received their CO, but they're in the process of moving all of their equipment onto that site in the industrial park. So just wanted to point out some of those projects that, uh, that are at various phases, but, um, uh, but certainly I think I, I have a direct relationship with, with some of the changes that we've made recently. As far as our planning and development um, and code enforcement budget changes or requests, uh, we, um, you know, during the course of this year, we had uh, an employee, Dave Oliver, who used to be our code enforcement officer. He <clears throat> left and took a, a job and kind of moved closer to family in the Virginia Beach area. And we were lucky enough to hire Jesse Hess, uh, who uh, is now going to be a full-time uh, code enforcement officer, but also assist us with, um, I'm sure you can recognize a lot of the additional volume that we've, uh, that we've received. So he's getting kind of plugged into the land use planning and then also uh, supporting the code enforcement function, which we think is uh, really beneficial to us just because of the seasonal components of a lot of the complaints that we receive for code enforcement, you know, have a lot to do with like kind of April to October sort of irrigation season with weeds and, and the like. And so a lot of the projects that we work on uh, during the actual development part, uh, portion of our process take place prior to construction season. So they can construct during those periods of time. So we think he will be a, you know, kind of a, a priceless asset for us to be able to fill in and, you know, kind of make the most of that transition from part-time to full-time. So this is uh, the second thing uh, is, a, is a kind of a big change for, for our department, but it's been in budgets in the past. We just haven't been able to, uh, to complete it, but we've requested $75,000 to start uh, to, um, you know, potentially move towards implementing to a completely digital platform for uh, plan review and development review, short-term rental licensing, and kind of a total integration with our GIS and our process as um, uh, in like the current planning space. And so we've been kind of starting to do demos and, you know, trying to figure out what exactly our needs are. And then hopefully if you know, that is uh, kind of moves through the budget process and we have that plugged in for 2022, we will then be pretty ready to just uh, issue that RFP and try to get a consultant on board to, uh, to kind of transition from what really is just sort of paper form right now into a fully uh, online uh, platform. So we're really excited about that. This, uh, this third thing is not in our budget, it's in the CIP, but we certainly are going to be working on uh, getting an RFP issued for the uh, the grant that was awarded to us this year for the Mulberry uh, outdoor spaces, and that's not for construction; it's for for design, and that'll be a pretty you know involved community process to see what sort of amenities uh, we would like to see if that that space were to transition into a full on closure uh, that would be year round. And you know, I'm sure council and members of the downtown uh, business community will be very involved in that. And so you know, we'll try to make that as as transparent as possible. Uh, goals uh, for code enforcement. Uh, we have, but prior to Jesse uh, being hired, we had a really strong connection between Dave Oliver and a lot of our HOAs. And you know, with a new employee, we're we're trying to you know kind of cement those relationships between our code enforcement officer and um, uh, and those HOAs. And so, you know, now that you know, there's a little bit more opportunity to meet. You know, in person, you know, we're gonna we're gonna try and and take that step and have uh, Jesse host some HOA summits and bring the fire marshal to that and and you know kind of explain what he does and the roles between the HOAs and and the code enforcement department or division within uh, planning and development. And so that's that's something that we're gonna work pretty 
uh, pretty hard at doing and then making sure that we maintain a very current list of who is you know, the HOA presidents and, and the like, just so we can have that connection between those associations in the city. Uh, Jesse has really taken kind of the, the ball and ran, ran with the short-term rental licensing. And so he's actually going to maintain and do the licensing and inspections annually for, for all the short-term rentals that uh, they get licensed within the triangle, but also the ones that are licensed outside of the triangle. And he's actually done all of those already and is getting ready uh, to do those in the first quarter of 2022. So at a, a a meeting, I believe next Monday, you know, we were, we were going to, next Monday, we were going to, you know, kind of put him in front of the council and, and explain kind of what our strategy is for how we're going to do those inspections and annual licensing and get feedback from the council and make sure that that aligns with the direction that we, that we received earlier this year. Um, as a part of the development review software, we also are going to uh, try and use uh, an additional module, which most of the software applications have kind of a suite of things, uh, but code enforcement and complaint uh, software will be embedded into that, that development review and overall permitting software that we'll be you know, striving to implement in 2022. So that will be a part of that. So it won't just be planning, it will be you know, likely a lot of the civil review and engineering and then also the, the code enforcement that component as well. Uh, for planning and development, you know, at, at, at not, not our next meeting, but in two meetings from now, we'll be uh, putting together you know, the entire land use code for, uh, uh, for the staff to recommend before city council for approval. It's already gone to planning commission. So that's gonna be a big piece. That's kind of two huge projects, comp plan and code, you know, kind of in completion. So that's gonna be a, uh, you know, kind of a big, uh, big end to what, what has just been a massive lift for a relatively small staff. So you'll see Jessica come back before the council, who's our, our planning consultant from Design Workshop, make that presentation, kind of align it with the feedback that we've received from planning commission and council, and that will be before you later this month. And then another big uh, goal for us, it's also kind of a performance measure, but um, council's very well aware that we're working and exploring kind of all avenues with attainable and affordable housing and the strategies that, that come from ownership and for rental product. And you know we're ho really hopeful and glad that we're kind of clearing the queue a bit uh, with some of the other planning efforts to you know kind of dig deep into you know what it's going to take to stand up what really is going to become a new chapter for Fruita and and hopefully supporting that effort in a, in a very meaningful and financial way. And that concludes my presentation and be happy to answer any questions that the council might have. Or do you have any questions for Dan? Uh, I, I don't know where the Mesa and Mulberry multifamily units are. How do I miss that? Where are they? So they're on South Mesa. Uh, it's, it's one lot north of uh, 6 and 50 and South Mesa. So they can, yes, to Guadalajara, yeah. And then the Mulberry one is uh, just to the east of those Mulberry Street ho homes, the five homes that were constructed in uh, 2019 and 2020. Those are the ones? No, those, it's right. It's just to the east of the, the ones that were constructed. So, uh, how soon do they uh, start construction on those? They're hoping to uh, start within a month. Well, they're approved. They haven't started building yet. Oh, I thought you were saying they were done. I was like, how did I not see that? One is that lot that had that oval cement thing on it. Got it. Right there. What I, what I well, mean is that's that, an, you know, I mean, they, they have to get through the, the land use process and the, okay. the plan review at the building department, and they're going to start doing some clearing and grabbing utility work and foundation work uh, here within the next month or so. Okay. Right. Any questions for Dan? No, but I'll just say, can I give you a compliment? Not even about tonight, but uh, at the property summit. Yeah. He was so good. He was so proud to have you up there and not a different person that was up there that could have right. potentially been here. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not even close. No, that's um, not. But no, Mike. You haven't been on council long enough to Dave know. Dave did a, or, Some of us have no Dave did a, good, Dave, did a great did a good job. job and I told Mike that we're probably going to have to pay him more money to keep him because he's kind of this rising star in this whole thing. So good job. Really appreciate that. Thank yeah. You. All right. Thanks, Dan.
for keeping on task tonight. We could get them to turn red. All right, with that, we're gonna move into our next buzzer presentation. The bar has been raised really high, so we're expecting great things here on our police department presentation. We've got Dave Krause, our chief of police. To... No, quality, with speed. We're not gonna, we don't wanna sacrifice quality. <clears throat> Good mayor, pick two. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> mayor, council, thank you for the opportunity to present to you the 2022 public safety budget. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to start by just uh, doing a quick review of our 2021 budget and some of the things that we were able to accomplish with that. Uh, in 2021, our dispatch fees uh, decreased by 7%. And um, as you're aware, the public safety tax dollars that we bring in are still primarily going to uh, pay for our public safety um, or, or our 911 fees uh, with additional uh, dollars left over from that earmarked for uh, potential uh, new future positions. And in fact, in 2021, uh, council approved us to add a new sworn position, which we are very grateful for. And knowing that that approval had occurred, we were able to start uh, recruiting for that position late last year and had someone identified that we were able to hire early in 2021, which allowed us to enter the year uh, fully staffed and have we have remained so uh, throughout 2021, which is quite an accomplishment for us. We haven't seen that in some time. So that's some wood and hope that we stay that way through the remainder of 2021 and continue that way. Uh, you also approved for us uh, monies for our body worn camera program that uh, per legislation we will have to institute uh, in 2023. Uh, we just wanted to get a head start on figuring out the bugs of that and making sure that the officers were familiar with the cameras, how to use them, how to manage that data. Uh, so uh, with that funding, we did in fact uh, contract with Axon, who was previously Taser, uh, by both the hardware and the, the digital evidence storage for us for body cameras. And as of right now, we're about 90% implemented with our body cameras. We've got about three or four officers that have not yet been trained on their usage, but that will happen by the end of the year for sure. Uh, also, one of our big projects for the year was transitioning our policy and procedure from what we had previously to a uh, system, a contract system uh, through Lexipol. And uh, one of the benefits of that uh, particular uh, organization is that they regularly provide uh, updates on uh, not only statewide, but nationwide police best practices, as well as legislation that we have to follow in case law. So uh, that's automatically updated for us in our policies and we can roll that out to the officers with some training. and. Uh, we successfully implemented that uh, just about two months ago. And um, we were also, with that, we're able to post our entire policy manual on our city website. So uh, just to, for ease of access uh, for the public as well as transparency, we wanted to make sure that was available. And it is, uh, with Shannon's help, we were able to get it on the, the city's website. And so all 487 pages of our policy manual are on there. But <laughs> Rest in some exciting reading. You're not covering that tonight. What's that? You're not going to cover that tonight. <laughs> well, a little bit, maybe. Uh, just the first 200 pages. And also in 2021, uh, we had one replacement patrol vehicle. Looking at our 2021 performance measures, um, some of the things that we were looking at trying to do this year, one of the things that we actually didn't have to do, thankfully, was to utilize some. Uh, more out of the box thinking on recruiting uh, strategies. And since we were able to enter the year fully staffed and continue that way, we have that's been unnecessary for us. Um, again, uh, we uh, updated our policies and procedures and published them on the website, got the body worn camera system rolling and um, all of our police blotters in addition to you know the policy and procedures. We also post all of our police blotters weekly onto the website. The timer? Sorry, that? that was my <laughs> <laughs> uh, Our feral cat uh, issue is still in progress. Stacy has made some uh, great uh, strides along uh, with the help of Councilor Lennart um, for engaging with some 
citizen groups that are interested in uh, helping us tackle this problem. And I think uh, we've got some good plans in place and it's just a matter of uh, working continuously with those groups to see those through. And I would expect that uh, when the time comes in the budget process, you may be hearing from some of those uh, community groups uh, for some of the, the citizen or the community grants that are available. Our school resource officers are continuing to uh, make sure our officers are familiar with all of the school campuses uh, in the event that there's an emergency or just a, uh, any kind of a, a need for officers to respond. It's important for us to be familiar with those campuses as well as the administrations. So we've done uh, that training and are continuing to do that. Uh, in investigations, we uh, wanted to make sure that the, our detectives who get information from other Agencies and jurisdictions are sharing that information with the patrol officers, and they've been doing that regularly and are continuing to do so. And uh, the one thing we did not quite accomplish in our patrol traffic and patrol division was uh, our goal of uh, Lexapol has a, a a feature where they issue training bulletins, and we can have as many or as few as we want of those. And our goal was to do at least one of those a month the officers, but because our implementation was delayed in getting Lexapol established as our as our policy, then uh, we have not engaged with the, the training part of that yet. The, the, the actual implementation of the policy was pretty lengthy and time consuming, uh, making sure we go through all those policies and, and that they are what we want for our community and uh, making any changes that we need to do. So we were a little bit delayed in getting Looking on to 2022, not a lot of um, big ticket items or anything uh, significant with the 2022 budget. But some of the, the highlights that you may notice in the budget document are our dispatch uh, costs are increasing uh, at about seven to eight percent for 2022. We are not uh, we're not in line for any vehicle replacements, nor are we asking for any additional vehicles uh, this coming year. There's a slight decrease in some of the service contracts uh, with the Axon and Lexapol contracts because of the implementation fees that we uh, had to pay in 2021. We don't have to do that in 2022. We did ask for a slight increase in some of our uh, supplies and safety equipment budgets to purchase some less, less lethal equipment and some ballistic shields. Uh, this was equipment that was identified during our administrative reviews of our 20, 2020 uh, officer involved shootings uh, that uh, officers identified would be nice to have uh, some more of the safety equipment available. And so we did make some uh, purchases this year, but we uh, want to increase that next year in order to make that equipment more widely available to the officers. Uh, we've requested a uh, increase in hours for our part-time evidence technician. She's currently working 15 hours a week. We've asked to increase that to 28 hours a week. Two reasons for that primarily are um, we're, if we're trying to do a comprehensive 100% uh, inventory and audit of our uh, the property and evidence that we currently have in storage. And as I'm sure you can imagine, that uh, takes some time. So uh, some additional hours are needed for that. And additionally, with the increased data management for the body camera video footage that has to be distributed for court purposes and open records requests. The additional hours uh, we hope will help with that increase as well um, without having to hire another person to try to manage that data. We're also looking at a potential reclassification of sorts uh, for our records technicians. Uh, we're going to have some personnel changes we expect uh, at the end of the year and I think that may give us an opportunity to add some more duties to our records technicians uh, that should hopefully uh, help the officers maybe be able to spend more time on the street and not be called into uh, you know the front counter for you know, low-level administrative type things just as a for example uh, when you buy a vehicle out of state 
and you want to register it in Mesa County, you have to have the vehicle identification number verified by law enforcement or the DMV. And as it is now, typically, if someone comes in to do that, which is fairly frequently, then an officer comes in off the street and does that. But it doesn't require a sworn officer to do that kind of a duty. So that's one thing that we are um, looking at asking our records technicians to be able to do since they're right there at the front counter and they engage with the person and, and uh, greet them anyway, then uh, we expect that they could be able to fulfill some duties like that that will allow the officers to have a little bit more time on the streets. Some of our performance measures and goals we're looking at for 2022 uh, in the administration division, uh, we are going to endeavor to increase our social media presence and post uh, crime prevention education information at least monthly. And we hope that by doing so, our public will notice uh, increased engagement and outreach and education efforts. Uh, this is many of these uh, performance measures and goals are directly a result of the citizen survey uh, that we recently got. And so uh, a lot of our efforts are going to be aimed at increasing uh, what it, our citizens are telling us they want from the police department. Uh, similarly, in investigations, uh, they're going to be tasked, our detectives, with uh, developing and presenting crime information and prevention seminars at least uh, twice a year. And they are particularly uh, skilled and knowledgeable about things like um, cyber crimes and frauds and the kinds of things that I think we can uh, educate our community about. And in the uh, Traffic and Patrol Division, we're going to evaluate uh, how our officers spend their time and see if we can develop more opportunities for them to uh, use their undedicated time for more informal interactions and more proactive patrol, and spend more time in the neighborhoods, which again was identified as an area that uh, the community would like to see more of from the police department. Uh, to end, I just wanted to share with you some of the comments that we received throughout the year. This is a very, very small snapshot of some of the things that uh, our citizens have told us. Um, very rarely, certainly a week doesn't go by, very rarely does a day go by that we don't have visitors bringing us cards of appreciation and posters and cookies and all kinds of great snacks. You don't share those with us? And we do not. We keep them to ourselves. <laughs> But uh, it's just, uh, you know, we go into the businesses here and they treat us like royalty and we're just so fortunate to, to be able to work in this community. And just to give you an example, some of the things that we've heard throughout the year uh, regarding Stacy Neem, someone called in and wanted to thank her for working on a barking dog problem and you know, how helpful she was with that and how much better she made the neighborhood. Uh, a mother of a 19 year old who was involved in a motor vehicle accident I wanted to thank the officers for you know, the impression that they left on her son. Especially, she pointed out, you know, the, some of the national narrative that maybe isn't so law enforcement friendly. Uh, she, she thought it would uh, be nice for us to know how much the residents of Ruta appreciate us. Uh, Lisa is one of our detectives and someone thanked her for her hard work on a case. It was a pretty significant uh, home invasion robbery case and uh, the work that she put into it and how she uh, made the victim feel important and respected. And then uh, from our local emergency room staff, uh, we got a shout out for three of our officers who went to help with a, an aggressive patient who had assaulted some of the staff there. and. and they were very appreciative of the response and then follow up and, and visiting and making sure things were still going okay that night. So um, again, uh, I think our officers would be really proud to for us to share some of those things with you all and so that uh, you hear some of the, the things that we hear from our citizens and just to share with you what I hear from the officers every day is how much, uh, how grateful they are to, to be working here in Fruta and how lucky they know they are to be here as opposed to some of the other places in the nation that uh, we really have to work with. So that's all I have for the budget presentation. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Thank you, Dan. Mm. 
just a comment, which is I know people appreciate the thank you notes back when stuff is delivered. Thank you. Thanks. All right, now we're going to vote on which one was the best presentation for the night. <laughs> so, um, all right. The personal yeah. stories. Yeah. <laughs> all right. With that, we're going to move into our city manager's report. I do not have any updates tonight. All right, duly noted. All right. Um, with that, we're going to go into council reports and actions. Uh, first one is uh, resolution 2021-29 supporting and advocating for the passing of the school district 51 bond measure 4B to rebuild Grand Junction High School. Do we have any more discussion on that or do we have a motion to approve? Mayor. I move we adopt resolution 2021-29 supporting and advocating for the passing school district 51 bond measure 4B to rebuild Grand Junction High School. Second. <laughs> Councilor Buck? Yes. Councilor Cray? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Motion passes 6-0. All right, our second item is a housing technical advisory working group, a request to approve the appointment of uh, those listed in our agenda with that. So, Mike, you've got. I, I need to double check, but I thought I noticed, and I could be wrong, but uh, Kevin Bray isn't listed on that list, and he is part of that group as well. Okay. With those listed with the addition of Kevin Bray. Any discussion or do we have a motion? I move to appoint the individuals listed above, adding Kevin Bray to the housing technical advisor. Second. Second. Councillor Cry? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Lenhart? Yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Harvey? Yes. Councillor Buck? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. All right. With that, we're going to move into our third item, which is. Uh, uh, discussion of possible action to consider a motion to convene an executive session to receive legal advice from our city attorney pursuant to CRS section 2464024B regarding a real estate transfer fee and affordable housing program. Do we want to do any council? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I just that? realized that oh. I forgot to put council reports and actions That's at the top. in the list Good for idea. the executive session. Before the executive session, uh oh, we're changing the agenda, but that's all right. All right, let's go. <laughs> let's go through. Yeah, that's all right. I'm good with that. So we'll start down here with Matthew. Do you have anything to? Um, yeah, you know, we had the Western Colorado uh, Economic Summit that I know a lot of us were at. I think that went very, very well. Uh, Dan, uh, truly really great job on that. Um, we will be having interviews for two finalists for the executive director's position. Uh, somewhere between the 11th and 13th of this month. All right. Thank you. Heather? Nothing. Ken? Um, nothing. Kyle? I just wanted to report that uh, the history fair went really well. There was uh, 150 or 200 people that went to that uh, at Cavalcade during Fall Festival. Um, there's a ton of interest in it. A lot of oral history was shared with uh, members of the board from the community. Um, a lot of interest from the community in terms of sitting on the Historic Preservation Board, which is cool. Um, and then just a couple, couple more things in regards to the Historic Preservation Board. Um, they discussed and, and um, took a vote that they would like to increase um, the, the potential number of board members from five to seven to five to nine, uh, just because of that interest. And there was also discussion um, about having the council liaison not be one of those potential nine members and, and only vote um, if there's a tie. That way, if there's nine members on the board or eight members, um, and I, brought, I wanted to bring that to you guys because I think the council has to ultimately approve that. I think it'll probably just be put into the the new I don't land know what the use is or what they um, we'd have to find out. Shannon probably has those the charter. Oh, the, is it the charter? Oh. 
Yeah, the preservation board may there, there's some that are in the charter and some by ordinance. So we I we'd have to just double check. I don't want to guess off the top of my head. So. All right. But we can we can look. I, I know a lot of what's that? It's in final. Yeah. So that's all I've got. Kyle, are those uh record are those uh oral presentations recorded? That uh, that's something that we discussed. No, they weren't. Okay. Um, but it's it's one of the things that's come up is that we need to do a better job of recording some of that oral history. Um, it's kind of maybe fallen through the cracks a little bit lately. So, yeah, it was discussed. Yeah. All right, that's it now. Karen? Um, yeah, Dave is gonna miss this, but we had some police presence in our neighborhood um, with uh, cars that had been broken into. And we, I mean, we just, have to keep reminding people to lock their vehicles because that's really um the big thing people you know they leave their vehicles unlocked and then get broken into so just that reminder but it, it was really nice you know to see the the police cars out there and they were yesterday um yeah was it was at sunday or or the oh it was over the weekend yeah and um yeah so yeah they're very responsive and Showed up on my Ring app. Really? Mm -hmm. In terms of neighborhood alerts. Lori? I have a question, and maybe you guys, Shannon, can maybe follow up with BLM. So I was at um, Coca Pelli last Monday, and there were skydivers that were landing on Wrestler's Loop, and there were two vehicles that were parked up on top of the bench. And there was like, I don't know, six or seven skydivers and just a bunch of stuff happening. And I didn't know that that was allowed. So is that worth looking into? It was interesting, but also weird. Yeah. Now you're going to tell were... me they land on my property? <laughs> <laughs> my property. They were jumping off of Upper Cook, like Mary's yeah, and airplane. landing on rustlers? They were on a plane. Oh, yeah. I thought you meant like parachuters, but or base jumpers, but you're talking skydivers. Holy yeah. crud. Okay. Interesting. I just, I, I, I sent you something for what you have to read for uh, executive session, who's being invited in, into that. Oh, something right. new we have to, we have to announce, sorry. That's all right. No, I have my phone on silent, so I didn't get that. All right, is that it, Lori? All right, the only thing I've got, um, I've got a, a couple things. So one, um, I've been asked to present on Thursday to what's happening in our community forum panel with the other two mayors in the Valley. Um, Dave Krisney put that together and it's kind of like a higher education thing. So Mike's helped get some information together for me on that. Uh, the other one Shannon touched on in this presentation, we had four interviews for different um, marketing firms. Uh, we've narrowed it down to two. Um, and we were thinking we were going to pick them last week at our meeting and we're still trying to debate because we had a couple people missing from that meeting. So we want to get all their insight before we do that. Because one is Slate, who's going to stay here, and the other one's Colvito, which is a, another agency. And so we're going to have another meeting in the next couple of weeks just to bring to council kind of what we think is going to be best uh, for us. So um, that's all I have as well. So with that, now we can move into the executive session. So we'll need a motion to... I move to move into meet an executive session to receive legal advice from the city attorney under CRS section 24-6-4024B regarding a real estate transfer fee and an affordable housing program. Second. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Freeman? Yes. 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 All right. That recording.